Okay, so uh, the link has been sent to uh, world title challenger Katharina Thanders. We're going to be talking with her shortly, hopefully. Well, I haven't heard back yet. Don't know if she's uh, preoccupied. We'll see. In the mean and between time, we'll talk about some interesting subjects that's going on right now. You know, a lot of people was high off of um, Jeremy Ennis's performance with uh, Sergey Lipinets. I think it's going to be hard for him to get fights. Like, everybody's talking about that he's on the right side of the street to get fights. But you got to wonder, you know, you really got to wonder if guys like Keith Thurman, Sean Porter, Danny ain't going to fight him because Danny's going up to 54. So, you know what I mean? Like, it's going to be, I think it's going to be hard for him to get fights. I do. The saving grace is that there are other familiar faces out there. I don't really see Ennis getting like a David Avanesian fight, but I think he could get like a Igis Kavalyowskis fight. I think he could get a fight like that. I think uh, I was rocking guess BJ. I think he could get a fight with like a Igis Kavalyowskis mean machine because he's a promotional free agent now, so he could go where he wants to go. And you know, you could always cross compare how. Um, Jaron Ennis looked against Egus to how Crawford looked against Egus because that's that's how the situation is going to be treated. We all know that triangle theories don't actually work in the sport of boxing, but people use them anyway. They do. They use them to promote fights. They use them to promote fighters. I, I, I'm of the opinion that no, triangle theories, they don't work, but it does tell you, common opponents do tell you where a guy is. You know, he might go in there and look bad. He might go in there and look great. But at minimum, it'll tell you more or less where he is, that he can beat a certain caliber of opponent. I would want to see, I would actually want to see a Jaron Ennis versus um, Igis Kavalyowskis. I think that's a good fight. Um, I think it can happen. And uh, yeah, I mean, Igis is not a small welterweight. And I, I say it all the time. They're like, a lot of people talk about Keith and Danny and those guys. But those is not big welterweights. Like Igis Kavalyowskis is a big welterweight. Like that's a guy who he could, you know, fill out even a little more. He like that's a guy that's essentially cutting down to make welterweight. That's that's what he's doing because he's a big cat for a hundred and forty seven pounder. He's a big guy for one forty seven. So I could go for that. Um, everybody's talking about the Showtime schedule, which I think is a it's a good schedule. Five out of the nine fights are fights that I'm going to sit down and watch. Five out of the nine. The other ones, mm, I mean, like, come on, dog. If 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 we're getting the undisputed 140 pound title fight between Josh Taylor and Jose Ramirez without any additional cost to the consumer. How could you then turn around and charge that same consumer eighty dollars to see um, Davis versus Barrios? Nothing against Barrios, but I mean that's that's not pay per view worthy. Pay per view worthy. When people say that, the context that they're talking about are fights that are highly anticipated, fights that people were asking for, fights that people are looking forward to. This is not a fight that anybody was looking forward to. And it's not a pay-per-view just because they tell you it is. It's not pay-per-view worthy just because they tell you it is. I was rocking Fish, was rocking um, Mark, was rocking Gav, Timmy. Burn the coal, pay the toll. I'm more interested in Lubin Rosario. I agree. I'm actually more interested in the chief support than I am the main event. I'm more interested in Rosario versus Lubin than Davis versus Barrios. I'm not actually interested in that fight. Um, what's rocking, Gene, man? What's rocking, Jamie? Rumors are, yeah, I know, but I mean, I like you don't see me talking about that story every single video because I'm already like certain things are common sense, and like the way that people try to make money on YouTube is is like talking about the same thing over and over. Like, I'm not going to do that. Like, I already see what direction everything is going. The dude didn't fly out to Las Vegas and touch base with Jorge Capetillo because the fight's not happening. They're not doing everything they're doing because the fight's not happening. It's pretty clear what direction things are going in. So the only thing we got to do is wait. 
It's just that, like I said in a, I think I said it in a previous live or a previous video. In this generation, everybody wants news now, 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 now. And at the same time, they're complaining about the updates that they're getting. But these are the cats that want news now, now, now. If there were no news, they'd be sitting around asking, well, why is there no news? But because there's constantly news coming out, they're complaining. So, I mean, to me, they're just a bunch of malcontents. And all you really got to do is sit back and wait. This is not a regular fight. This is not a regular sized fight. Any fight that involves those dollar amounts, 100 million to 200 million dollars, that that ain't no regular fight. Don't expect that to get made as quick as something else. That's not a regular fight. That's a major event. That's what that is. That's a major event. All right, good morning, Boxing God. Good morning, Boxing Savant. Hey, Julius, do you have an idea when the fight between Joshua? I believe it happens in July. I believe it happens in July. Maybe mid to uh, early to mid, early early to middle July. I appreciate that. Um, appreciate that, Ebo Sosa. Um, but I believe uh, mid early early to mid July. Now I don't really think it's gonna happen in August to September the way that Frank was speculating. It wouldn't surprise me if it did, but if I had to guess, I think it happens in July. I do. Um. And I'm looking forward to it. Uh, cool boy stuff. Stephen Fulton, he was on Twitter asking about, you know, how people have that fight. How do they see that fight? And um, I see Joshua getting them. I see Joshua knocking them out. That's that's what I see. If there's going to be a rematch, I don't know. That depends on how vicious the knockout is. If it's a referee stoppage, perhaps there will be a second fight. But if the knockout is punishing, if the fight is taxing and, and physically taxing, there may not be a second fight. A lot of people don't think about that, that, you know, they're acting like it's a guarantee that there's going to be two fights. It's only a guarantee that there's two fights if the fighters want to have two fights. If the fight is hard, you know, punishing, maybe there ain't two fights. I don't know. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Um, Is there a woman's title fight on this weekend for light heavyweight? Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's the fight with um Hannah Gabriel's. And I, I did a video on that fight. I did. I did a video on that fight that they got a WBA light heavyweight title, I believe, and a WBC heavyweight title. I think that's the way that they've got it. Um, There's a big chance Fury couldn't handle a loss against. Uh, I agree with that. I agree with that. I agree with that because um, of the way that the Klitschko situation was handled. When Klitschko uh, uh, had his rematch clause, he exercised it, and Fury dipped because, you know, he said he was mentally unfit. Now, whether you think that he was actually mentally unfit or you think that he was just saying that to get out of the rematch, whatever you believe, what we know is that the rematch didn't happen. So my interpretation of that is I don't really feel like he handles pressure all that well. I don't. That's just my opinion. Uh, whereas Anthony Joshua is an Olympian, competing as an Olympian and competing at that level, those are high level, high pressure situations. That's like, like you, you know, in the amateurs, you don't know who you're going to end up with. You don't know who you're fighting. So you get accustomed to seeing different styles. And for you to get that far where you compete for an Olympic gold medal, that's high level, high pressure situations. And it takes mental fortitude to be able to deal with that. The way that he lost to Andy Ruiz, that could have broken mentally, but it didn't. He knows what he he knew what he did wrong. He knew what costed him the fight. Maybe there were outlying factors, but whatever corrections needed to be made, they got made, and he got his belts back. You can't do that type of stuff if you're a mentally weak person. You you can't do that. You you crumble the second that things go sideways. To me. It's funny because uh, Fury's undefeated. Joshua has a loss. But to me, Joshua is the more mentally strong fighter. And the proof of that is he went right into that immediate rematch against the counsel of his contemporaries. His contemporaries was telling him he shouldn't take that fight again. They were telling him, yo, you should fight someone else. Have an easy one. I believe it was um, I believe it was Lennox Lewis and Oliver McCall. When Lewis lost to McCall, they didn't have an immediate rematch. Now, uh, when he lost to Rockman, they had an immediate rematch. But when Lewis lost to McCall, they didn't have an immediate rematch. Give me one second. Give me one second, y'all.
But yeah, when Lewis lost to, uh, I believe it was Oliver McCall, he had several fights in between there. In between there, Oliver McCall had actually already lost to Frank Bruno. You know what I mean? So that's not saying that that Lennox never had a, a, an immediate rematch. That's saying that, you know, some of these instances where the guy lost the first fight but won the rematch, they didn't happen straight away. That's one of the ones that didn't happen straight away. There was a lot of people telling Anthony Joshua that he should fight someone else, take an easy one. But you see what his focus was like, nah, I want to fight him. I want my rematch. I want my belts back ASAP. And he got them back. So to my point, you can't do stuff like that when you're a, a, a mentally weak person. You, you can't. Well, that is, you cannot accomplish that because you know what? You might sit there and want the rematch. You might want to run it back, but maybe you lose. You know, and what does that do to you psychologically? But it ended up working out. All of it ended up working out against the criticisms, against the counsel of his contemporaries. He ended up getting those belts back. And I'm of the opinion, well, that's the type of stuff that makes you mentally stronger because suffering builds character. Who do you see winning a potential or to a better beef versus Joe Smith Jr. fight when it's made? I think that people should not take the Vlasov fight out of context. Maxim Vlasov campaigned as a cruiserweight for three years and 13 fights. He's about six foot three. To my knowledge, the WBO does not have a rehydration a clause, the cap, that prevents a guy from coming in over a certain amount of weight. That being said, the reason I thought that Joe was going to take him easy is because Vlasov had not fought in over a year. So I'm thinking, you know, he's got size and he might be very durable because he campaigned as a cruiserweight, but maybe the time off will hurt him. The time off didn't bother him. It, we could see that. The time off did not bother Vlasov. But I think that people are looking at that performance in the wrong scope, in the wrong lens. Maxim Vlasov is a huge light heavyweight. So if the guy that you fought before you fight or to a better beef was a huge light heavyweight with a frustrating style that he stays off the line and he's going to try to muscle you around and tie you up and do awkward stuff. If that's who you fought before better beef, that's good. That's way better than if you would have went in there, got a first round knockout on a guy and you go into the better beef fight thinking that's what's going to happen. Nah, expect a war. You was just in a war. You was just in a hard fight. Good. That's what you need to expect when you fight Artur. Does Joe have a chance? I believe he does because I think not only does he take a better punch than Artur, he takes a better punch. I think he has a better chin than Artur, but I also think he has enough power to hurt Artur. Don't let Vlasov eating them right hands make you think, that, oh, yeah, Artur is going to eat one of those, or he's going to eat three of those. The reason Vlasov was able to eat that is because he's a really big guy. Artur ain't six foot three. He didn't campaign as a cruiserweight now. You know what I mean? So don't take things out of context, but that's just me. If you have Artur winning a fight, I could understand because at the same time, Artur is a very strong puncher. I believe he's the, he I believe he's the strongest puncher in that whole division. I believe he's the strongest puncher, and I do believe that he's a more subtle, better boxer than Joe. That's not saying I don't think that Joe can win. I actually think he can win. I think he can win. I, it, that, that's the best way to call it, J.D. That was a wake-up call. That's, that's the best way that you can describe that as a wake-up call. They're like, yo... You know, you want to fight better, be right? But don't expect that to be easy. That's that's not going to be easy. So it's good that he had that difficult situation with Vlasov. To me, that's a blessing in disguise. Like, yeah, wake up. You know what I mean? You beat up Jesse Hart and you beat up, um, you beat up Aleda Alvarez. Don't think that's what's waiting for you. All right, Katarina's here. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Now, let me introduce you, everybody. I'd like to introduce world title challenger from Norway by way of Spain today, Katarina Tedes. How you doing? I'm doing good. What about you? <laughs> I'm doing good. I was just talking a little bit of boxing real quick. Now, I want you to acquaint the people that don't already know you on how it is you found your way to the sport of boxing. Like, 
what what led you to become a professional fighter? Uh, I started quite late, so I started when I was like 18 years old, and uh, um, uh, the first sport I, I started with was actually kickboxing. Um, but after after a few years, I, I switched over to to boxing. Um, and yeah, <laughs> I didn't do many amateur fights. Uh, so after after eight amateur fights, I went over to to the professional game. So <laughs> okay. So what's your? I always I, I ask everybody this. What's your favorite thing about being a boxer, and what's your least favorite thing about being a boxer? I think what I like most is the training, the hard training. Uh, like all the things that we have to do on a, on a daily basis and of course the adrenaline that you feel when you when you are in inside the ring and what i like what i don't like that much maybe is everything that is outside of the ring <laughs> the business yeah everybody says that they don't like the politics they don't like the business but they love what the, the fighting and the training that's what they love yeah, that's it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, beyond that, uh, there's a lot of conversations about the three minute round and whether or not women should be allowed to fight for three minutes or did, are you, or would you be happy with things staying the way that they are? Where do you stand on the three minute round? Yeah, well, I'm always defending the three minute rounds. I would really like to go three minute rounds, but I think. You know, I've heard I've heard some other logical reasons saying that we don't really get paid for the three minutes, and you know, it, it makes sense, you know. But of course, uh, considering the style that I have myself, for example, I, I think I would have an advantage with with three minutes, definitely. And and I felt it many times when I had a fight that I really felt that I had hurt my opponent and then suddenly the bell, you could hear the bell. So I, I think that if we would get the three minutes, we would get also more more knockouts. And um, yeah, uh, it would be even more exciting, I think. <laughs> and you know, I think all the girls that I know, they all train three minute rounds in the gym. And uh, I, I think we're more than capable of, of doing it. So. Why not? <laughs> I mean, we should have the same rules as the men. Um, and, and the money part is just, you know, some, something else that we have to work on to get it more equal, of course. But yeah, um, I, I defend the three minute rounds, 100%. <laughs> okay, we segue from the three minute round to the pay scale. This is a burning topic. A lot of people are very, a lot of different opinions. I've talked to a lot of fighters about this. What's your take on the pay scale? Why do you think there's such a difference between how the men get paid and how the women get paid? Well, I think there are several reasons, but I, uh, the main reason um, is, is due to the fact that we're not promoted the same way. You know, if, if, um, <laughs> if people invest the same amount of money promoting female fights, as they do with the, with the, with the male fights, I think we would see a huge difference. Uh, then, of course, it has to do maybe with the level of, of the, the fighters, and I think right now we're we're in a very good moment because we see that you know we have several, we have many 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 girls with a high level of boxing, and all of that is a good thing to to create more interest for for the sport so um but mainly i think it's because we're not promoted in the same way and uh and maybe 15 years ago we were not able to see a lot of level in 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 female boxing and that's you know that's also something that is true you know but that is absolutely changing now <laughs> So yeah, because that I mean, from where I'm sitting, I'm a consumer. So the biggest difference that I notice is we all know how um the infrastructure of boxing is, how the money gets made, where it comes from, where it's generated. And to me, the issue is there's no such thing as equal pay in boxing for men or women. 
and it's a marketing issue. The women are not marketed the same way with the same yeah. amount of finance that the men are because they pour a lot of money into those guys. So by the time they do that, you know who those guys are, you've seen them fight. And I, that's what I don't see happening for, at least here in America. I can't say for, you know, over there in the UK because Eddie Hearn is doing a good job with his stable of fighters. Sarlin Promotions, you, Dina Thorsland, I see that they invested in your careers. And what I, what I don't see is here in America, I don't see that on that same scale. Like I don't, well, let's say Golden Boy Promotions because Golden Boy is the only promotional outfit here that I see that actually has a stable of female fighters. They got Sulem Urbina, Sinisi Estrada, Marlena Esparza. They recently signed uh, Areli Mucino. They got Franchon Cruz. But that's the only outfit I see that actually has a stable. So as a consumer, what I see is that the marketing is the issue because there's no such thing as, to my knowledge, there's no such thing as um, equal pay in men's boxing because you look at Chocolatito, who's a four division champion, there's guys that they make a lot more money than he does and he's very accomplished, but yeah. he, they make more money than he does. So, you know, everybody, yeah. does, everybody doesn't make Canelo money. So everybody doesn't make um, Anthony Joshua money. So what's the difference between those fighters and everyone else? Marketing. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's the key. That's the key, of course. So what do you think can be done from a marketing perspective to raise awareness and thereby affect the pay scale? Because you're on the other side of the business, whereas everything I see is as a consumer, is as an individual who spends money to see boxing, whereas you see the other side of the business, you see inside the industry, what do you think can be done to affect change to thereby affect the pay scale? Well, I think the first step, and, and I think I'm seeing this quite a lot now, and it's like speaking speaking about it, you know, if, if we're all loud about it and actually making like a statement that we have to change this, um, you know, I, I think sooner or later we, we have to see something there. Uh, then, of course, each boxer has to do, uh, you know, what, what we can do to promote ourselves. We, we have now something that we didn't have before, like social media. Uh, you know, and even if you don't like it, I think you, we should all look at it like a job, just to, like, post our workouts, to let people see what we do during the days. Uh, and, of course, making sure that the team that you have around you, managers, promoters, that they actually do this job of, uh, of you know, doing this marketing and promoting. Uh, so it's, I don't know, it's like a lot of pieces that has to, <laughs> to go into the puzzle, yeah? It's not only one thing, but, but several things. Um, but what we can do ourselves, of course, is trying to promote ourselves as, as much as we can, even if it's difficult sometimes. Uh, you know, we, we do have the platform of the so, so, social media and, and we should really try to, to use that as much as we, uh, as we can. But yeah, then you have this other more structural things that are more difficult for us to do something with. <laughs> mm -hmm. But definitely speaking loud out about it, I think it can do, you know, a huge difference. Now, that you know, takes because a... I think... No, no, yeah, go ahead. Go sorry. Ahead. Oh, all right. I wanted to ask you. About no, but I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. You got it. <laughs> no, no, ask me, ask me. <laughs> well, because, all right, there was a fight uh, last week. I, I think you heard about it. Shannon Courtney, Ebony Bridges. And uh, one of the things that was talked about was the way that the fight was marketed, how Ebony Bridges uses her femininity as a marketing tool. I wanted to ask you, how? what's your view on that? Do you think, do you find any aversion at all with that? Where do you stand on that? No, I think each person just has to be, um, uh, how do you say it in English? You have to be like you are, you know? And I, I think I think that Ebony Bridges is just acting as, as she is, you know? She's just being herself. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, if you have people want, wanting to criticize that, that's their problem. You know, I think that every individual is free to do what they want to do. And, 
and I think she was very smart <laughs> with with marketing herself in this way. And you know, I think they they both gained a lot of followers in just like a week in time, and and they got a lot of attention. And she said that that was one of her main goals, and she definitely reached that goal. So um, you know. I would never criticize any fighter and i mean she she gave she gave people a really good fight so you can't really criticize anything <laughs> mm -hmm. you know if, if, if she wants to yeah you know she's free to do whatever she wants yeah <laughs> now about the fight uh, what did you think about the fight did you see the fight and what did you think about it it was an exciting fight you know with a lot of action um yeah and you know she she showed everyone that she she was a warrior i i, I saw her winning maybe three four rounds i think the scorecards again were quite quite bad i think two of the judges said 98 to 92 that's quite crazy but it's not the first time that happens um but yeah i think it it was definitely you know an exciting fight and a fight that shows that women, you know, they can they can go hard fights. They can uh, they can take a lot of pain as well. I mean, Ebony was boxing with this huge um, <laughs> blue eye. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I can only say positive things about the fight. Really, I think it's good for for female boxing. Yeah, it was it was a great fight. Now, in reference to your own career. I wanted to know, I don't know how true it is, but I heard that you're going to go up to the lightweight division now. You're going to go up to 135 and you'll be campaigning there from here on out. Is that true? Uh, yeah, um, lightweight or even maybe super lightweight. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. I think um, my next fight will be in super lightweight, actually. Oh, 140. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Is is there anybody out there you have your eye on? Like, do you want a Leonardo Datu fight, a, a Kaylee Reese fight, a Mary McGee fight, or a Chantel Cameron fight? Is there anybody up there that you really have your eye on that you're looking at them specifically? Yeah, I always have my eyes on on the best on the best uh, female fighters. Every time I get this question, I I always say that I'm interested in meeting the best. I'm not interested in, you know, maybe my next fight will be more like a tune-up fight. But, you know, after that, I, I want to meet the, the best people I can meet in, in the division. So, of course, you know, I, I'm a huge fan also of all of them and, and I want to meet them in the ring. And I also think that the fact of moving up in weight will be a good thing for me. Uh, I've been in the super featherweight division a quite long time and I continued to be in this weight because I knew all the time that I was going to get like good opportunities in this weight. But I could say that maybe the last two, three years, it was very difficult for me to, to, uh, to lose the weight and to be 130 on, on the scales. I mean, it's, it's possible, but it's very, very hard for me. So um, I think that being more able to focus on on the training and not that much on the weight will give me a lot of positive things in in my future fights now do you have a tentative fight date like is there a you know not official yet but is there a, a date that you're looking at for your comeback uh yeah well i've i've heard like several not dates but you know but it's being a bit difficult now because of all this COVID situation it's difficult to, to make um, events with the crowd. So that's now the thing that is stopping everything a little bit. Um, but the, the last thing I heard now was that I was, that I'm, I'm probably gonna fight in the end of June. So yeah, I'm crossing my fingers and, and hoping for that to happen. <laughs> now, and just staying active. Now, I wanted to ask you, when everything got shut down in last March till now, how did you pass that time when, you know, like, what was your reaction when you saw, like, yo, everything's shutting down, there's no sports, there's no audience, the whole world is staying inside? How did, what was your interpretation of that? Um, yeah, you know, 
I had to switch the, the <laughs> switch the mentality quite a lot and quite fast. I was also in Spain at that time and it was very, very strict. We were not even allowed to go out to the streets. So, I mean, you, you couldn't go out to run, for example. So I, I basically trained in my garden and in my living room for almost two months. And I was also quite lucky because I had my coach coming to me and we were doing like pads in, in, the, in the garden. And it went quite good, but it was very strange, yeah. Se sintió como que el mundo se estaba acabando, ¿no es verdad? La verdad que sí. Como el apocalipsis en la Biblia que hay la... la the plague y toda la vaina y todas las cosas. Y, ay, Dios, yo tengo 38 años, ¿verdad? Nunca en mi vida yo he visto una cosa así. Nunca en mi vida. Una pandemia que everything shuts down. Everybody's inside. Everybody's scared. Yeah. I was scared, bro. I was scared. Yeah, me too in the start because you went out and it was police all over, like stopping you, like, okay, where are you going? Yeah, I'm going to the supermarket. Okay, can you show me the ticket? Yeah, okay, here you can see the ticket. It was really, really, you know, like this. So, um, and it's, we still have quite many restrictions. Like we have to be at home before 10 o'clock in the evening. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we have to wear the mask all the time. <laughs> bueno, eso a mí me gusta. I feel like a superhero when I go outside, when I put the mask on. I feel, like a, I feel like Batman, so I kind of like the mask, to be honest. Like, it's kind of cool. Like, yeah, I feel like Batman. I throw my hoodie on, throw my mask on. I look like a Mortal Kombat character. Yeah. I, I like it. <laughs> That's good. That's good. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. All right. Um, beyond that, all right, let's see. So you're going to, so you, you're looking at either 130 or 140. Um, you're open to fights with any of the champions that are there. The next thing I want to ask you is, um, who are your influences? Who were your influences in the sport as you were coming up? Was there anybody that, you know, you drew inspiration from when you were coming up the ranks? Uh, yeah, as female fighters? You any mean? fighter, any fighter. Oh, any fighter. Yeah, well, many. <laughs> it's, it's, uh... It's always a difficult question, but as a female, I, um, Lucia Riker, I, I, yeah, I love her fights. And I also used to watch a lot Melissa Hernandez. I think her style is, is really nice to watch. Uh, she has a lot of skills. Uh, Amanda Serrano. I think, well, I would really like to see her against Katie Taylor, for example. I think that would be a massive fight. And then I always like Miguel Cotto, uh, Sergio Martinez, <laughs> uh, Roy Jones Jr., Mike Tyson, uh, all the Mexican fighters. I, yeah, uh, Eric Morales, uh, Barrera. Um, yeah, I could say so many, many names. <laughs> okay. Ahora. Te voy a hacer la pregunta. You were born in Norway, unless I'm mistaken. You were born in Norway, pero tú habla como tres idiomas. Sí. Habla nor Norwegian. You speak Norwegian. Habla sí. inglés y habla español. ¿Cómo sí. fue que, que eso pasó? Porque esa combinación no se ve mucho. Que somebody <laughs> speaks Norwegian, somebody speaks English, and they speak Spanish. What else? What other languages do you speak? <laughs> no, that's about it. Well, I understand Swedish and Danish because it's very similar to Norwegian. Um, yeah, but no. <laughs> well, I, I was born in Norway. My mother, she's Norwegian. And um, I always spoke Spanish with my father because he was also raised in Spain. And then we came to Spain when I was like three years old and I've been here almost my whole life um, so i came when i was three years old we went back to norway when i was like seven and then we came back again when i was 12. so i've been almost all my life uh, living in spain yeah and english well my english is not really good but <laughs> i learned it when i was in in norway because 
the television, everything on the television is in English. So um, it's a country with a lot of American influence, I think. <laughs> I'll say that your English sounds fine. I'll say, look, your English is better than my Norwegian. I wish <laughs> I could speak Norwegian as good as you speak English, because. Thank you. <laughs> Now, um, aside from boxing, is it true that you play the piano? No, just a little bit. <laughs> I, was, I was like, yo, is she a superhero or something? Because she speaks three languages. She plays the piano. She fights people. <laughs> like, like Wonder Woman, like something like that. Like, yeah, I like music. I, I used to play the piano as a kid. Uh, but, you know, it's an instrument that when you stop playing it, you lose a lot. But... Um, yeah, I think I played the piano until I was like 15 years old. So I, I remember some of it and I can kind of improvise things and I can read the notes and all of that. But yeah, I wouldn't call myself like a pianist or, <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> all right. Now, Norway, Spain, very different climates. Yes, Norway is very cold and it's my understanding. I've never been to Spain, so I don't know. But it's my understanding that Spain is very hot. Yeah, in the area where I live, we have a quite nice weather, yeah. But of course, if you go to the north of Spain, it's also quite cold. So it kind of depends where in Spain you, you are. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, now we're gonna, I'm going to ask you, who do you feel, aside from yourself, aside from yourself, who do you feel are the top five women boxers in the sport of boxing? Female or... We'll, yeah. we'll do the females and then we'll do the guys. Okay. Uh, Katie Taylor, Amanda Serrano. Um, uh, oh, sorry, you take me a little bit. Senia <laughs> <laughs> um, Sastrada. Mm, mm, mm. Jessica McCaskill. Mm, mm. <laughs> and five. Uh, Jelena Merjanovic. Mmm, mmm, Jelena, mucho. Ella es una, um, I don't know how to say it in Spanish, veteran, veteran, que ella tiene mucho año en el deporte. Sí. Mucha experiencia, mucho título, sí, mucha sí. pelea. Sí, la verdad que sí. Ok, lo, ahora lo macho. Who's the top five guys in the sport of boxing? Oh, that's so difficult. <laughs> <laughs> um... Canelo, eh, Lomachenko, eh, do they have to be like, can I say whoever or can it be like a prospect or something like that? Sí, porque es, es, con, los ojos de, es con los ojos tuyos, ¿me entiendes? En vale. tu opinión, ¿cuáles son los mejores? Lo que pasa es que es tan difícil. No, yo sé, es que, pero... There's no wrong answer. Si Katarina yeah. piensa que estas son, estos son los cinco más mejores, pues eso es lo que ella piensa. There's no wrong okay. answer. Okay, so Tyson Fury also. I really like him. Um, how is this guy? Uh, Ch Charlotte? Is that his name? ¿Cómo se dice? Charlotte. Charlo. Yeah. El, el alto, el, el, el uh, middleweight. Sí, el del pelo así como rizado, que tiene okay, un hermano. Sí, sí, sí. sí. ah, los lo, lo, lo gemelos, los gemelos. Sí. Uh, I said five, yeah? No. Uh, eso dijiste Canelo, Lomachenko, uh, Tyson Fury, Charlo, fal falta uno más. Ah, falta uno, falta uno. Eh, ay, no sé. <risa> <risa> si digo uno es como que me voy a sentir mal por los que no dije. No, there's no wrong answer. Si eso es lo que tú piensas, eso es lo que tú piensas. A ver, el quinto, a ver. Mm. Ay, no sé, o sea, me quedé en blanco. Me quedé en blanco. <risa> ok, tú mencionaste a Tyson Fury. Ok, Tyson Fury, Anthony Joshua. Anthony Looks like they're going to fight. ¿Quién yeah. tiene el dinero de Katarina Tenders? ¿Con quién está el dinero? ¿Está con el Tyson Fury? ¿O está con el Anthony Joshua? Tyson Fury. ¿Cómo piensa que él gana esa pelea? Yo creo que a los puntos. Mm. 
you think that also oh, all right for those that don't speak spanish i just realized we've been speaking spanish the whole time for those that don't realize uh Katharina is going with Tyson Fury to win on points. She believes a points decision is the likeliest outcome when he fights Anthony Joshua. Yes. Okay, okay. I'm gonna ask you small trivia questions, small ones. Uh, what's your favorite fight that you ever saw, male or female? Just your favorite fight that you ever watched? Uh, for example, go, uh, if I have to say a female fight, um, I really enjoyed watching the Melissa Hernandez versus uh, Halbach. I don't know how you pronounce mm. her name. I know you're talking about. I know you're talking about. Uh, I thought I think that fight was a very good fight for Melissa Hernandez. Well, I think it was a draw actually, so it was quite quite exciting. Um, now for the males. Um, uh, Sergio Martinez versus Sabeth, um, you know? Mm. Sergio, yeah, 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 yeah. Yo te, te quiero hacer esta pregunta. What do you think of all these YouTubers? Porque va a pelear un YouTuber este fin de semana, el, el, el uh, Jake Paul con Ben Askren. What do you feel when you see YouTubers trying to get into the world of boxing does it bother you does it not bother you yeah it does <laughs> it does i i don't think it's very good for the sport <laughs> uh, and what is kind of worrying is that people are even excited about it and i'm like who wants to watch this <laughs> not me <laughs> not me i don't <laughs> No, <laughs> but it it's worrying, you know, that it gets so much like attention, you know. But no, of course, I don't like it, and yeah, it it does bother me. So vamos a decir que ellos te llaman y te dicen, mira, queremos que tú te pelees con Kate del Castillo. You take the fight. You don't take the fight. <laughs> if they pay me good money, why not? <laughs> Everybody gives me that answer that, yeah, I don't like it, but if they call me, I'm in there. Yeah. If I'm going to get the money that I don't get fighting the best fighters in the world, <laughs> then I'll take it. <laughs> Yo veo que, que um, hay mucho uh, ex -box, well, boxers that retired and they're coming back. What do you think about that also, that like Mike Tyson, Evander Holyfield, um, hasta Sergio Martinez, he came back and he's ranked in the WBA. Um, yeah. ¿quién más? Oscar de la Hoya dijo de que he's gonna have a comeback también. What do you think about that? I think it depends on, on each person, of course. Um, regarding Sergio Martinez, for example, I, I know that he's doing it because you know, he was very motivated and, and, you know, he's training very hard, like he's training twice a day and, and putting in the work. So it's not only words. And why not? Why not? Um, if, if we can see that they perform after, you know, I think it, it's a good thing. Uh, but, you know, it, it depends on each situation, I think, on each person. If if they do a combat uh, comeback and we see like a city fight, then it's like, see, or, or or if we see like a boxer that comes back just because of the money, that's that's sad, you know. But if it's because they really want it and it's like a real motivation, yeah, why not? Why not? All right, all right. I think uh, lastly, what I would like to ask is if you could go back in time to watch one fight, what would that fight be? Oh. <clears throat> uh, um, the one with Manny Pacquiao and, um, and Marquez, the last mm, one. Which one? There were like four. Four, yeah, the last one, yeah. Que cuando lo noqueó. <laughs> sí. No, pero fue una buena pelea, fue una buena pelea. Sí, pero 
eh, yo recuerdo en esos tiempos, ellos pensaron que lo mató claro. porque no se estaba moviendo, que cuando lo tumbó, no, estaba, no se estaba moviendo, man. Y, like, I actually mm. thought, like, you die? Because he... I don't hear you. ¿No me oye? No, no escucha nada. ¿Quién es mi now? Hola. ¿No me oye? Uh, ok. On that, let, let me... Can you hear me now? Ay, ahora sí te oigo. Es que no, no, te, no te oía. No, que en ese tiempo yo pensé que, que, que Marqué lo mató porque se parecía que the way he fell, it was like, yo, oh, is he good? Like, yeah, it's quite bad, yeah. It's yeah. very scary. But I think he started that punch like over and over again until he... <laughs> He made it. <laughs> sí, eso es lo que dicen que, que he was he was working on that counter punch in yeah. camp that he because he you know he already fought Manny three times so he knows the tendencies que él tiene que si yo hago esto él va a hacer esto después mm -hmm. contra golpe and I'll get him that that's at least that's what I heard. It was yeah. a beautiful counter punch. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so con eso muchas gracias Catarina for yeah, coming yes. on. Buena suerte. Uh, stay COVID free is the way to be. Look forward to your next fight. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye. See you. <laughs>